Okay, this is a continuation of the book review of Dr. McDougall's book, The Digestive Tune-Up, and this chapter is called In Search of the Perfect Bowel Movement. This is from a slide where Dr. McDougall was giving a lecture on these topics, talking about his mentors, and one of his mentors was Dennis Burkett. And Dennis Burkett had said, if the people have small stools, they will need big hospitals. But if they have big stools, they will only need small hospitals. And this was based on Dennis Burkett's experience in Africa. Dennis Burkett was an Irish surgeon who had worked for a while in England, and then he went to Africa where he worked for about 17 to 20 years. He became in charge of all the epidemiology in Africa for like over a thousand hospitals. And he had other people that were sharing, you know, their knowledge and research, clinical experience with him. And what they noticed was the people in Africa, he was in Uganda, by the way, the people in Africa who were eating plant-based diets, they had much, they had more bowel movements and larger bowel movements than the people eating westernized diets. But they avoided lots of diseases. The fiber adds water to the stool, makes it bulkier. What happens is when the rectum becomes distended by the stool, it stretches and then it has a reflex contraction where the muscle contracts, the sphincter opens up, and a person has a bowel movement. And of course, we all know there's stress factors into it and the convenience of the moment. Okay, but this is a real important point. Big bowel movements, you got healthy people, you only need a small hospital. These are the cartoons from the original uh, Burkett Lectures as drawings. Okay, so this is the description of a normal bowel movement by Dr. McDougall. He says, a perfect bowel movement should be pleasant. It's quick. It doesn't require severe or repeated straining. The soft feces distend the rectum, cause a reflex contraction of the rectal muscles, opening of the anal sphincter, and there's a sense of complete evacuation, relatively complete evacuation. The feces should be soft. Uh, this is on page 70, by the way. Uh, if you eat beets, the stool will be dark red. That's the way you can play a trick on a first-year medical student. Feed them some beets, don't tell them what to expect, and then the next day, say there's a, a lot of people getting uh, blood in the stool and whatnot. It'll also turn their urine, uh, look like it's blood-tinged. Okay, it's normal to have one bowel movement, to have a bowel movement one to three times per day. In some people, it can even be normal to have a bowel movement every other day. Um, the key is that the bowel movement should be soft. Uh, you don't want to be pushing out Tootsie Rolls or goat pellets. Um, when you first start the McDougal diet, you'll notice quite often that the bowels will almost seem hyperactive for one to two weeks, then they settle down. In my opinion, what I think is happening is, you know, there's sort of a battle between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. The good bacteria feed on the fiber. The bad bacteria are the old ones from the SAD diet. And so it's almost like a territorial thing. The good bacteria take over. Um, constipation is a common problem for sad diet eaters, and dairy is one of the most common causes of constipation. He says that dairy, in a sense, partially paralyzes the peristalsis muscles of the intestinal tract. Um, on these low fat, on these, I'm sorry, on these low fiber diets and uh, high fat diets, one can even get anal fissures. Okay, and in the sake of full disclosure, I had one of those many, many years ago. Gosh, it was about 25, 30 years ago. And uh, 25 years ago, I think, right before I became um, just a, I initially was a lacto-vegan, um, the gastroenterologist told me, ah, don't go for surgery, it hurts too much, it's real painful, just, you know, eat your high-fiber diet, and it'll probably go away on its own, and it did, okay, but that was a painful thing I had for a little while. Fiber pulls water into the stool and softens it. It slows down the absorption because it takes time for the intestinal enzymes of digestion to separate the glucose from the fiber. So it slows down the absorption of glucose. So you get less of a blood glucose spike because their absorption is not so rapid. It's more gradual. This prolongs your satisfaction of hunger. This helps you avoid getting rebound hypoglycemia. Fiber also helps to increase the amount of estrogen and cholesterol that is removed from your body with defecation. Uh, that's a good thing. It lowers your blood cholesterol level and it helps your body excrete. The, when you have too much estrogen in your body, it's excreted by the liver in a conjugated form like with glucuronic acid and that is then passed out through the stool. It's defecated out of the body. But if you have a lot of bad bacteria due to a low fiber diet, they will have an enzyme called glucuronidase which unconjugates the estrogen and once it's unconjugated, it gets reabsorbed into the blood. Um, Fiber supports the good gut bacteria. They use it to make short-chain fatty acids, which are used in part to maintain the intestinal lining, the enterocytes, the tight junctions. Um, about 70% of the followers of the Atkins diet, and something similar for paleo, keto, carnivore diets, because they're all low in fiber, um, that are high in, in meat and dairy, they have constipation. And the result is that they usually have, you know, 
rock hard, feeble, uh, like marbles in their feces. Um, and they'll, they can defecate as seldom as twice a week. And that's not a pleasant bathroom scenario. A lot of people who've eaten a poor diet all their life, they don't even know they're constipated. They just think it's normal to only have a bowel movement once every three days. That's not normal. Um, and because these fecal marbles are so small, they don't really distend the rectum. So you don't get much of a, you know, that reflex <clears throat> movement of it stretching the rectum and then causing a reflex contraction. So it's harder to evacuate. Fiber is only present in plant foods. There's no fiber in uh, meats uh, or in milk, dairy products, and there's very little in processed food because it tends to be refined. That gives it a longer shelf life. Uh, the SAD diet is very low in fiber. The average American's only eating about 12 grams of fiber per day. The McDougal diet provides about 40 to 100 grams, so you at least want to get 40. Uh, some people say you should at least get about 48 to 50. McDougal says our natural diet, I'm sorry, not McDougal, Dr. Burkett says our natural diet, we were probably eating about 100 grams per day typically. Um, avoiding animal foods and eating low-fat vegan is a great way to prevent constipation. Exercise and hydration help a little bit, but Dr. McDougal felt they were minor contributors to better bowel movements. The big thing was eating more fiber. Okay, here's a drawing of abdominal pressure syndrome as described by Dennis Burkett way back in the 1960s. You know, we talked about it. Straining at defecation increases abdominal pressure. The increased abdominal pressure on a chronic daily basis is transmitted to the rectal veins. You get hemorrhoids. Transmitted to the groin, you get varicoceles in men, which can cause infertility and lower testosterone. It's transmitted to the sigmoid colon, so you get outpouching in the sigmoid colon wall. That's diverticulosis. If one of them pops, then stool leaks into the mesenteric fat. That's diverticulitis. Patients get admitted to every Western hospital at least once a week for that. I drained tons and tons of abscesses on those patients because, uh, you know, stool infects the mesenteric fat. Um, they also get the stomach pouches up into the chest, get a hiatal hernia, increased gastroesophageal reflux, and everything goes with that. The sad diet eaters, lack of fiber makes the stool dry on the right side of the colon, and the dried out stool can form a stone a stone of feces, lith means stone, so fecal lith, because it's in the appendix, it can also be called the pentacle lith. The mucus secreting glands of the appendix continue to secrete, but they can't get past this obstructing stone, a pentacle lith, in the more proximal appendix, so the appendix will stretch, and then that's painful, and it'll even burst. That's a perforated appendicitis. I've drained a bunch of abscesses for that. Um, the back pressure of constant daily straining at the stool is transmitted down into the leg veins, and that'll also cause a varicose vein, so that's the scoop on um, abdominal pressure syndrome due to a lack of dietary fiber. Here's a, uh, Dr. Dennis Burke, and he was interviewed by Dr. Uh, McDougall. As a matter of fact, the only uh, Dr. Burke interview that I'm aware of on the internet is where he was interviewed with um, Dr. McDougall. If you go to Dr. McDougall's YouTube channel, you can just you know search for Burke, and you'll see this. It's about an hour long. It's a very good interview. Um, he also you know, has a lot of other unique stuff. He's the only guy who has, I think, well, no, there is other interviews of Pritikin, but he's got an interview with Pritikin that's very good. And then on his YouTube channel, he's got the legacy book of Pritikin. He's got the book of Kempner. But anyways, the interview with uh, Burkett is very good, about an hour long, well worth watching. Um, here's a good biography of Dennis Burkett by Ethel Nelson. She was a physician herself, and I thought this was a great Burkett, one of the best, a great Burkett biography, one of the best I've ever seen that really summarizes his life and how he made all his discoveries. He figured out Burkett's lymphoma, you know, and then he uh, figured out abdominal pressure syndrome, rather two extraordinary achievements. Another guy who should win a Nobel Prize, but they'll never give him one because they don't want the public to be aware of those things. Okay, Dennis Burkett lived from 1911 to 1993, and Dr. McDougall said when he was a senior resident, he had an experience that changed his life. He just went to, you know, a routine everyday noontime conference, medical conference, and Dennis Burkett was the lecturer. Dennis Burkett said, America is a constipated nation. If you have small bowel movements, you will need large hospitals. If you have large bowel movements, then you only need small hospitals. The key to big bowel movements is to increase the amount of dietary fiber. Um, and then uh, Dr. McDougall said that Dr. Burkett was the first doctor who ever told him that diet and health were directly related, that the foods we consume cause the majority of our most common diseases. And I had the same experience. I came out of medical school thinking the American medical system was the greatest thing that ever existed in the history of the world. All you do is match the yield of the pill, send the bill, you make money, the patient's cured, and everybody's happy. It wasn't until later that I learned that the pills usually don't work, and they never cure any of the chronic diseases. Um, and that, you know, I thought nutrition was a big joke, that it didn't matter what you eat. That's partly why I got fat in my, uh, in my early 30s. Um, 
So anyways, Burkett working in Uganda. The African populations he worked with mostly ate a lot of yams and brown rice. They had faster intestinal transit time. Um, and he noticed that the meat and dairy eating Westerners, Americans or English that had been out there, only made about four ounces of stool per day versus the Africans eating the plant-based diet made about 16 ounces of stool. So they had four times more stool uh, quantity, volume. Among the plant-eating Africans in Uganda, there was no type 2 diabetes. Nobody was fat. There was no appendicitis, no diverticulitis, no inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease means ulcerative colitis, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, hardly any dental caries, uh, varicose veins or hemorrhoids or hiatal hernia. He had only one case of gallstone uh, related gallbladder disease in 20 years, and it was from a judge who had recently been in London where he's eating beef and you know a relatively westernized diet. And again, I got the page, neighbors on, page numbers on here if anybody wants to follow along with that. Um, the book went into the pathophysiology of appendicitis, tachitis, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, hiatal hernia, GERD, like I kind of briefly alluded to it. And we covered some of that earlier in this book review. Uh, Dennis Burkett, some more quotes by Burkett. He says, diseases can rarely be eliminated through early diagnosis or good treatment but prevention can eliminate disease. Yeah, that's one of the biggest myths of conventional medicine. The average patient, they think all this screening stuff is wonderful. And, you know, imagine you're, you run a hospital. You love it. You turn all these otherwise healthy people, you turn them into patients. I mean, what could be better than that for making money off people? But the real thing is go low fat, low sodium vegan and prevent the disease. That's so much better than getting an early diagnosis, which is often a false positive or an incidental loma and traps you into years of follow-up and very expensive problems. Dennis Burke continues, the citizens of countries who don't get colon cancer, they don't get polyps either. And I told you previously, some people have seen their polyps completely go away like Chef AJ when they went low-fat vegan. Dennis Burke continues, if people are constantly falling off a cliff, you could place ambulance under the cliff, but wouldn't it be better to build a fence on top of the cliff? We are placing too many ambulances under the cliff. Western doctors are like poor plumbers. Imagine an overflowing sink that keeps spilling water onto the floor. The American doctors, the Western doctors, they just try to dry the floor. Why don't they learn how to turn off the faucet? Turning off the faucet is low-fat, low-sodium, vegan, and all those other things we talked about. Get your sleep, get your exercise, manage your stress, avoid toxins, avoid oils, avoid caffeine. Dennis Burkett continues, the only way we are going to reduce disease is to go backward to the diets and lifestyles of our ancestors. Yep, and that's why I, I, I routinely say we should live like Adam and Eve, but keep our indoor heating and plumbing. So anyways, uh, that's it for part six of Digestive Tune-Up uh, book review. Hope that's helpful.